The beginning of this episode has depictions of violence and may not be suitable for everyone. Hi, I'm Terry Knight. And two years ago, my children, Sarah and Philip Gehring, I don't know if you remember the case they were murdered. They um, don't deserve to be buried on the side of a road. I don't deserve to have them buried on the side of the road, and we need to find them and bring them home. In 2003, Terry Knight's children, 14-year-old Sarah and 11-year-old Philip, were murdered by their father, Manuel Gehring. Terry Knight and Manuel Gehring were divorced and in the middle of a custody dispute. The two children were spending Fourth of July with their father in Concord, New Hampshire. Instead of returning the children to their mother at the end of the visitation, Manuel Gehring shot them and crossed several states before burying their bodies. He was arrested one week later in California and confessed to the murders. He began to try to help investigators find the children's bodies, but he didn't appear to know exactly where he'd buried them. Law enforcement transported him in a van across the Midwest, and Gehring tried to describe visual markers, but they weren't specific, really just somewhere along the Ohio Turnpike. The search was unsuccessful, and Manuel Gehring killed himself awaiting trial. Terry Knight continued searching for the bodies of Sarah and Philip. She drove 650 miles on Midwestern roads through Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, and Illinois, pleading with the public along the way to help her. She was asking for the public's help in any type, any way they could do it, whether they were psychic, whether they could pour over maps, whether they could, you know, drive that route. She would take any help she could get. This is Stephanie Dietrich. Stephanie's lived in northeastern Ohio her whole life. She knows the roads and intersections. And back in 2005, she read about Terry Knight's press conference in her local paper. It was on the front page. And right then, Stephanie decided she would try to help. So I didn't know I was supposed to sign up for a search group. I just thought, you know, you do what you can where you can. And that's what I did. Stephanie Dietrich speaks very practically about the whole thing. Terry Knight asked for the public's help, and as Stephanie put it, am I not the public? Her own kids were grown and had moved out of the house. She'd been at her job at Acme Grocery for a long time and was starting to cut back on her hours. I asked if she told Terry Knight she was going to start searching, and Stephanie said no. I didn't want to disappoint her. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Initially, the FBI didn't release a lot of information to the public about where Manuel Gehring said he'd buried his children's bodies. But when years passed, and Terry Knight had taken her plea directly to the public for help, the FBI decided to release as much of that information as possible, including a crude map that Gehring had drawn of the location. Well, he gave the um, he gave them a list of about ten things that they would find on the property of a like. A pile of dried firewood, um, some slabs of irregular cement, um, a six foot, like six foot tall grass. Um, There was a a pump with a green handle. There was a chain link fence. And when you get out and start looking for this stuff, it's amazing the places that have all these same things. Stephanie thought these markers sounded like they could be in a part of the woods outside Akron she knew pretty well, off Copley Road. She'd often take her dog out there and walk around. Oh, my God, this dog. What was the dog's name? Rico. He was Boxer and Rottweiler. Big or how much? Big, 116 pounds of pure muscle. She convinced her family and friends to go out with her and Rico whenever they could to help look. And she would call the local police departments often, giving them tips on where to investigate, pieces of land that she thought looked right. In fact, the um, FBI did send a, a evidence recovery team down there, and we went back af- that afternoon. I didn't know they'd been there, and I was like, man, Rico didn't run through here and make all these tracks through here. And so I called them, and they were like, yeah, we were there today. It's not the right place. And I was like, but did you see this, and did you see this? And, and the lady was real snotty, and she said, we're telling you it's not the right place. You're welcome to check it yourself. Click. 
And then I was pissed. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. So um, so the police were giving you a hard time. Like, why are you doing this, ma'am? This is... Right. Right. And I, I mean, they weren't telling me to get off of anybody's property. There was never any incidents like that. But um, when you get a man, a man detective, they're like, why are you doing this? Are you a prison junkie? Did you write to him in prison? What interest do you have in doing this? They just didn't understand it. A lot of people don't understand it. I just think it's the way that some people are wired. People that understand it understand it, and people that don't never will. She started seeking out tips and information from the Internet and would print out any articles she could find. She put them in a folder and kept them in her car. And these tips, combined with her knowledge of the area, guided her search. I went out to what I thought was going to be the place and pulled in and looked around and see these no trespassing signs and well, that didn't really bother me and um, got out with Rico and just started walking around because it was property that was owned by a construction company and it was just there was nothing on it at the time so we could just like pull straight in there and um, basically I was there so often that the man from the towing company across the street from that property pulled in in his tow truck one day and asked me if we had bought it bought that property how big of an area were you searching? Well, it was probably acre, a few acres, but I only stayed in, I mean, like maybe a two-acre area. And when you would look, would you let Rico kind of lead you on the leash, or would you be digging around? Rico, like when we would go for walks and stuff, not just looking for these kids, but either he's watching out for me or I'm watching out for him, but we don't ever both just, like, wander off. I, I, I can't explain it, but um, I could just wander anywhere I want to and know that dog had his eye on me. So I felt safe where I was at. Um, I would follow anywhere he wanted to go to. And when you were when you were walking around, would you I mean, would you carry a shovel with you? Would you be digging or would you just be looking down at the ground? I would only like dig a couple shovelfuls. I mean, I have a note where I stuck it in a hole. It says, please don't fill in this hole. Um, and then I gave them like the website for if you don't believe what I'm doing here, you know, check this. And I came back and there's a dirt bike. Had written over my note, but because um, you didn't, you wanted to not have to retrace your steps, right? But I didn't want to leave somebody's property with chuck hole, you know, big holes in it either. But um, why did you think that Rico could search? I mean, was he trained in any way? He, to do this? No, he just always went everywhere with me. I mean, everywhere I went, Rico went, and so it just made sense that if I was going to be outside, you know, you weren't hiding the fact that you were. Looking, did, did you, your 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 mother knew your friends knew? Did everyone know that you were out doing this? Yes. Did anyone ever say what in the world are you doing? Why are you spending some? <laughs> well, I mean, I pretty much do whatever I want to anyhow, you know. So, and it works out for me. I don't get in too much trouble, but I don't if, I don't offend people, and I don't like. Um, I'm not going to go stomping through, you know breaking down branches or climbing your fence or snipping your, you know, I try not to leave any trace I was here, you know. They didn't make, they, no one made, no one made fun of you or, or got creeped out and said, hey, that's enough, stop it. None of your family or friends. Well, they were a little worried, you know, I was obsessed with it, but. Were you? Oh, Yeah. Yeah. Stephanie began spending more and more time searching on Copley Road. Sometimes she would take her book and a lawn chair out to a spot she was searching and just sit there for a while in between her digging, letting Rico roam around. She started giving away her work shifts at Acme Grocery so she'd have more time to search. Um, I can remember calling. Uh, or call, I was supposed to be at work like at 10 a.m. and we went out there at 8 o'clock in the morning. I already had my work clothes on and stuff. Um, I called my manager, Jeff. I said, Jeff, I'm coming in, but I got to go down the FBI first, okay? And he's like, okay. <laughs> By November, she'd been looking for four months, and she started to slow down. We had all been together for Thanksgiving the week before, 
And somebody asked me at Thanksgiving if I was still looking for those kids, and I hadn't been out in a while. And I said, no, but i got to find them. She'd exhausted every inch of the woods off Copley Road. She searched other places in the area, but had no luck. So she moved her search to a new location in Hudson, Ohio, off Tyrex Road. This Arctic air was moving in, and the ground was going to freeze. And I remember my mom called, and they were in the middle of a move. And she's like, can you come help me? I said, no, Mom, i got to go find these kids. If the ground is going to freeze, and we won't be able to get to it. And will you describe how the new location kind of looked the same or different from Copley? Was it the same idea, a couple acres? Um... They both had the six-foot, this grass that grows in Ohio. It's like it's over six feet tall. And then as um, the fall comes on, it gets brown at the top and like like, almost like wheat's in it or something. I don't know. but um, And I thought it looked pretty good. So I called Hudson Police Department. And then the next morning, I wondered if they were out there. Like, man, did they go out there and check that out? And so that's why I went back up there, which— was to see if they were doing it. And if they weren't going to do it, I was going to do it myself. So they weren't there. So we pull in and park, and we whenever we go, we go back the 100 yards, and we start looking around. And just the look on his face, like, dig right here. And so I went and I stood over him where he was at, and um, I knew that the branches to the tree reached down toward the ground as opposed to stretching up toward the sky. The father had said that. And... I looked at this big branch over Rico, and all the little branches on it were snapped off. And I thought, well, that's too high for deer to have nibbled those off. Somebody broke those off so they could work in this spot. And the father had said that there will be just exactly room for one vehicle to have backed in. And I was like, oh, Rico. Just the way he laid down. So I get my little shovel and... I, I dig in once, and my shovel breaks. So I, we go back the 100 yards to the car, and I get another shovel, and we go back there again, and um, I dug, like, two good-sized shovelfuls of dirt out, and it was, like, clumped together. It was all real heavy clay, and I see black plastic and duct tape. And I don't know if it goes to the left or if it goes to the right. So I move one to the left, and it's still go. There's still black plastic and duct tape. And I move one to the right, and there's still black plastic and duct tape. And I was like, oh, we go. We got to go get help. I didn't look for anything else. It's like you know when you know when you know. And so we go back down 100 yards, and now it's getting dark, and the snow is starting to come in. And um, as... We get to the car, here here comes a Hudson police officer across the opening. And I'm like, oh, my God, an angel from heaven. And I'm trying to talk to her real fast. And I'm wiping snow off the back of the trunk of my car. And I've got all these papers that I've copied on, you know. They walked back to the site, and the officer cut a hole in the bag, which further confirmed what Stephanie thought. He called for supervisors, and they didn't want me to go back there again. And I didn't find it out until later, but when the supervisors got there... They cut the um, plastic a little more, and they saw the little boy's boxers. After five and a half months of searching, Stephanie Dietrich had somehow managed to do what no one else had been able to for the last two and a half years. She'd found the remains of Sarah and Philip Gehring. How did you feel on that ride home? Or when you knew that you had found them, how did you feel? Uh, I was also probably just pretty at peace with it. It's the only thing in my life that I've ever started out to do and finished. I swear to God, I never finish anything. And it never occurred to me. I never got, like, discouraged or, or disgusted. or um, It never occurred to me that I wouldn't find those kids. Rico just, if I hadn't had him... I probably I wouldn't have gone out like that if I mean I give Rico all the credit because he was the reason I was outside spending time with my dog. He was a little stressed out. In fact, he threw up in the car. But um, I always told him what a good boy he was. I have a dog now. She's just a dog. Oh, it's terrible to have a good dog first, and then just have a a dog. My name is Jeff. 
Strelzen. I'm a senior assistant attorney general and chief of the homicide unit at the New Hampshire Attorney General's office. He was the lead prosecutor on the case. I was able to meet Stephanie out there uh, at the spot where the children were buried. I have a picture in my office and I'm looking at it right now of myself and the dog Rico and Detective Flanagan were both uh, kneeling down at the spot where the children were found with Rico. And I remember that day extremely well. I was just, I was amazed that, that someone had that capability to carry through with it like she did. And then when I met her, it, it really made perfect sense to me that she would be the person to help us bring Philip and Sarah home. Have you ever heard of a citizen committing this much time to finding a body? You know, I haven't. Typically, people who just read stuff online and don't really do things. This is, you know, what Stephanie did is she got out there and she put her feet to the ground. Uh, she didn't just read stuff online. She actually got out there and looked at places. And I think that's pretty unique. Do you remember Terry Knight's reaction when the bodies were found? Relief. Um, relief because... As terrible as it sounds, you know, people can tell you, and we certainly told her why we very much believe that Philip and Sarah were dead, but until you know for sure, there's that lagging, lingering doubt in the back of your mind. Could they be somewhere else? Could he have taken them somewhere? And as much as logic tells you that's not possible, you know, giving her closure was important. We were able to bring her home some personal effects from the children, You know, and and I think that really finally allowed her to have some measure of closure. After word got out that the Gehring children had finally been found, the national media swooped down on Hudson, Ohio. Stephanie says news cameras were lining her street. Rico was given an official canine collar by the FBI. And Terry Knight, the children's mother, came to Ohio to meet Stephanie. She brought a big rawhide bone for Rico and sat down on the floor to greet him. We reached out to Terry Knight, but she didn't respond. She did say at the time, Stephanie Dietrich is the amazing spirit of what we hope people are. She's now remarried with twin girls. As for Stephanie Dietrich, she still works at Acme Grocery a couple days a week. Rico died two and a half years ago. Throughout our entire conversation, I kept trying to understand what she was thinking all that time. But she doesn't think she did anything that special. As she said, she knew the area and thought she could help. Criminal is produced by Lauren Spohr, Nadia Wilson, and me. Audio mixed by Rob Byers. Alice Wilder is our intern. Special thanks to Russ Henry. Julian Alexander makes original illustrations for each episode of Criminal. You can see them at thisiscriminal.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Criminal Show. Original music in this episode comes from Blue Dot Sessions. Criminal is recorded in the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. We're a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Shows like The Heart. The Heart is a show about how love and intimacy intersect with our lives every single day. Right now, they're in the middle of a new series about what exactly we're talking about when we say someone is feminine or masculine. The series is called Pansy. I love the idea of being able to, like on a hot summer's day, wear a skirt. If I want to wear a big chunky necklace one day, I will wear it. If I want to paint a nail, I'll do it. If it were socially acceptable for me to wear eyeliner, I would absolutely wear eyeliner. I just like the way it looks. I, I would describe myself as like a, an impassioned mother hen who identifies very strongly as male. I do twirl. <laughs> Go listen. Radiotopia from PRX is supported by the Knight Foundation and MailChimp, celebrating creativity, chaos, and teamwork. And thanks to AdCirc for providing their ad-serving platform to Radiotopia. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.